This week, Click is in Japan, where we'll be rolling, ponging, stroking, and screaming. Lots of screaming. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Crystals on fire on the shoulders of unicorns. I've watched sunbeams glitter in the dark near the Mountainari gates. All those moments have been lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to make some new Japan memories. In the land that inspired Blade Runner, we're spending two weeks exploring this unique country as it aims for the moon, reaches for the stars, and tries to look after its own backyard. It's going to be a wild ride. And just like in other parts of the world, a lot of fascinating research goes on inside Japan's academic institutions. Here at the University of Tokyo, they're putting something very interesting down on paper. This is projection mapping, where an image is projected onto a specially marked surface. And as the surface moves, the projector warps its image to keep it in the right place. The difference between this and everything that we've seen previously is just how accurately the projector follows the surface. The system is scanning the marker dots and understanding the scene 1,000 times every second, which really is faster than the eye can see. And it's this super-fast processing of the environment that Professor Masatoshi Ishikawa thinks will be necessary when we hand over more control to machines. Uh, machine vision has to be very fast, so the machine vision is applied to the vehicle, uh, the airplane and the factory automation and the security and so on. High-speed machine requires a high-speed image processing. How have you done that? How, what's the science behind this? So the, we have to design the high-speed and highly parallel processing system. That is a very difficult thing. And also, finally, we have to combine all of the things. So the, we have to combine with high-speed image processing hardware. That means the parallel processing system. Parallel processing system recognizes all of the things. So the, we uh, combine the high-speed image and high-speed image processing uh, capability into the one system, like one board or one chip. We're not just talking about projecting an image onto a fast-moving object either. They can also follow an object with a camera with incredible precision. So just look at how this ball is staying absolutely in the middle of the shot, no matter how fast I move it. And in fact, remember, it's a 1,000 frames a second, so we can even do this. Instead of having to physically move the projector, or here, the camera, it's this mirror that moves to catch the action, reflecting it up into the lens. Although there are no concrete plans to use this in the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, this would certainly give you a proper bullseye view of televised sport. And that super-fast image processing can also be put to other uses, including reacting to an opponent's hand gesture in the as yet non-Olympic sports of rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> See, that was so fast, I didn't even know whether it beat me. Okay. Right, paper, scissors. That's too fast for my brain to actually work out what's going on. Just for the record, it's identifying my move as soon as I start to open my hand and then countering with a winning move before my hand is fully opened. So basically, it's cheating. Uh, it may have won the game, okay. 
but I can take the moral high ground. <laughs> Now to Chiba, just outside Tokyo, where Japan's biggest tech fest is being held. Each year, SeaTech attracts more than 600 companies, many of whom show off their new ideas way before they're due to come to market. And Dan Simmons is there, picking out the best of them to show us. SeaTech seems to be full of these cute robots, but they're not as helpful as they look, so I'd rather show you something you might find useful. Now, it may look like a microwave oven, but this piece of kit is designed to tell me the number of calories and the sort of fat content, protein, carbohydrates of any dish that I put in there. At the moment, it just works with simple dishes. It uses near-infrared light and analyzes the reflections of those inside this device, and it should work with any sort of food um, eventually. It only takes about 10 seconds, and here, is what we have, this piece of quiche. Pretty calorific, I'd say. I might leave that one in there. It struggles with several foods on one single plate, and readings for my quiche varied a bit. So Panasonic says the Calo Rico is still a few years away. But fish has to be good for you, right? So doctor, I'm, I'm having these stomach pains. <laughs> What did you eat yesterday? Um, I ate some sushi. I ate sushi. I see. Then I'll check, so please wait a moment. And I'm waiting a moment. And that sort of interaction eye contact can be kept and also nobody needs to touch any device either it seems quite natural apart from that long distance call wait the translation is done in the cloud so response times will depend on cellular signal strength this manga book has had a makeover and again translation is on hand and the wristwatch has been brought up to date by epson and no, they didn't print it. Now, it's old school, it's analog, but it is smart. It will measure temperature, altitude, steps I've taken, calories, also UV light it can measure, the direction I'm looking in, and it can take me back to my hotel. Uh, by pressing this button, it shows me the distance I have to go and the direction, which I've set previously by pushing this button to set a waypoint. Oh. Oh God, I've just set the waypoint. And which, which? Okay, okay, I give in. Let's go back to the robots then. Panasonic's Cocotto loves teaching kids. It praises and cautions them while encouraging children to do daily tasks like clean their teeth or eat their vegetables. Parents can get the robot to nudge the child in the right direction through the app. But Cocotto can't be thrown or it'll break. It's a cushion with a waggy tail, and it wags differently depending on how you stroke it. I think it's time for man versus machine. For the first time ever, this year's version of Omron's table tennis playing robot, we previously featured on the show, serves. Do you get much of a rally in there? It's faster and it's meaner. <laughs> now, as well as tracking the ball, it's also tracking my body language. Which Omron says means that it can detect when I'm about to go for a smash and respond accordingly. <laughs> it didn't even move, did it? Let's face it, it didn't even move when I went for that smash. Are you okay? I nearly did. Okay. Uh, 
Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. Microsoft this week showed off its upcoming Windows Mixed Reality update, revealing an addition to its lineup of mixed reality headsets. The Samsung HMD Odyssey claims to make use of the update's full grunt by allowing users to navigate their environment whilst enjoying the VR or the AR experience or sometimes both. And Microsoft aren't the only ones experimenting with mixed reality. The National Theatre are testing smart glasses, allowing people with hearing impairments to enjoy live performances. The glasses shine light into the user's eyes to overlay captions on stage. Researchers have figured out a way to turn everyday objects and our body parts into remote controls. A simple webcam tracks movements in a room, and unlike traditional gesture control, the moving object could be anything, maybe a toy car or a hand. And off-the-shelf VR equipment could one day be used to control robots in the field. The virtual cockpit developed by MIT gives human pilots the feeling that they're right inside the robot's head. And finally, we got a look at Honda's latest humanoid robot, which it's been working on for the past two years. The disaster relief robot can move through narrow gaps, crawl over debris and even climb ladders. And in a Swiss cross-continent press event this week, Google showed off its new goodies specifically designed for the home. And I popped along for a gander. They're there when you need them. They're simple to use, and they anticipate your needs. We are introducing Mini. First up, the new Home Mini. This cute donut is a more compact version of the home, an assistant set to rival Amazon's Echo Dot, with a price tag to match of just under £50. And of course, a premium version called Max. With its main mission of playing music, it changes audio levels according to its ambient surroundings. Top of the lineup, though, was a search giant's new flagship smartphones, starting at £629. And here it is. This is the Google Pixel 2. This is the XL version, which is six inches in size. The regular Pixel is five inches. And it's actually moved the speakers so that when you're watching a movie in landscape mode, you're not muffling any of the audio. It's also got quite a little nifty feature, which is called the Live Edge feature, that when you give the phone a squeeze, it brings up Google Assistant, which will then help you on your way. What's the best phone? Hmm. Its camera has had a reboot too. It comes with a clever portrait mode, which creates depth of field found in professional photos with only a single lens, using machine learning to do so. Notifications and reminders, all without pushing any buttons. With a new always on display, the phone also shows you what song is playing in the background of wherever you are. It's always listening. The Pixel 2 particularly the XL version, is really good. High-end, meets the specs of the other competitors too, but it's only got a tiny percentage of the market, 0.5% compared to iPhone and Samsung. So it's got a tremendous amount of work to do to catch up. That was what was interesting. The VP of hardware came right out and said that we basically reached the same level for all high-end handsets at the moment. They've all got the same specs, they all look the same, and they've all got the same standards. So, he was saying that they're going to now rely on the software and machine learning, AI really, to try and make these things better than their competitors. And after having a dig at Apple last year for getting rid of the 3.5mm audio jack, <coughs> Google has done the same. Pixel 2 users will have to use an adapter that fits into the USB-C charging port to listen with their wired headphones, which is included with the phone. Or they could buy the new Pixel Buds, which when used with Google Translate, they say allows wearers to chat to people speaking a different language. But anyone who's ever tried Google Translate will know exactly how that goes. Hey Isabel, how's it going? Hey Isabel, how are you? Here's okay, Pack. Absolutely okay, thank you. 
at £159 for the pair, the earphones themselves have five hours of battery life, but can be repowered up to four times from their special charging case. It has to be noted that the translation app, Google's translation app, already does this. And so you can actually do this in any way. Whether it's possible for these two buds to act quickly and really produce you know, something approaching real-time translation is the key. If they can't do that, if it results in a stilted conversation with lots of pauses, then what's the point? Buds or duds, we'll soon see. And now it's back to Dan at SeaTech. Could this robot be top of the class? Denso isn't quite as dense as it may seem. It's answering university exam questions using artificial intelligence and then handwriting the answers. You can do anything here at SeaTech. Race a Formula E car, practice your windsurfing, even climb a mountain. But sometimes all you really want it's an easy time at the convenience store. Don't you just hate it when you finish doing your shopping and uh, you've got to scan through each and every single item before you can end up paying for it? Wouldn't it be better if you just popped your basket into something like this, pushed the screen, and it just knew exactly what was inside it? The reason why this works is because of these RFID tags. They've made them nice and easy to see, but they'd be inside the packaging. And we've seen them before, but these ones work through water and through metal. So you can actually put them inside. About 10 years ago, they tried to do this and couldn't scan all the items in one go by putting the basket in a, a reader. Now they can. Now, Murata, who make the new radio frequency tags, just need to find a way to make them cost-effective and reduce pricing from 10 cents each to a disposable one. With so many companies here vying for attention, I found a technology to help cut through the noise. Individual voice, and that's basically because as we grow older, it's more difficult to distinguish sounds, but also if everybody is talking at the same time, it's often quite tricky to pull out one person's conversation. But this microphone could help. It's listening very closely and can separate out two or three voices talking at the same time. Mitsubishi now, the Electric called this technology deep clustering voice, speech recognition, which uses AI and it's a world's first. Now, the system recognizes the individual components of my voice, and therefore it can go off and rebuild it, resynthesize it to cut out all the background sound. Mitsubishi Electric called this technology deep clustering speech recognition, which uses AI and it's a world's first. The company says one use could be better voice control of tech in cars when everyone's chatting. Now, how about feeling like you're in two places at the same time? Japanese outfit KDDI calls this telepresence, and the haptic feedback is crucial. And I have the ball, ladies and gentlemen, I have the ball. Here, the robot is connected to my body tracking gear through a wire, but with super fast 5G telecoms networks just a year or two away, the company thinks it will help operators work remotely anywhere in the world. This robotic arm has developed a sense of pressure to its touch, so although objects may look similar, it feels how much to squeeze them before lifting. And transferring distinctive feelings to us humans is what Alps is trying to recreate. The company already make components for smartphones and games controllers and reckon in two to three years you'll feel more than just vibrations. Oh, that is cold. Oh, wow. <laughs> I can feel a heartbeat, but I guess because my fingers aren't moving on the controller, I can't feel the fur. Oh, yeah, that's very good. And the sound as well from the controller adds to the sense of reality. Very hot. This is hot? Yeah, very hot. Oh! <laughs> oh! I think that could catch on. <laughs> that was Dan at SeaTech, and we'll end this week on a high. Literally. 
this is VR Zone Shinjuku, and it's only just opened, so we thought we'd drop in. <laughs> Spread over two expansive floors in Tokyo's expensive Shinjuku district, VR Zone represents a big bet on virtual reality being a big winner. After all, this tech, these staff, and this postcode don't come cheap. But before we take a look around, we've got a hairy situation on our hands. Time for me to don my super secret disguise and face my fears in the interest of feline well being. Curiosity won't get this cat, not on my watch. So I've got to rescue the kitten, which is on the plank. <laughs> I'm hanging off the end of a edge of a building. It wobbles. Holy cat. All right, just stay there, kitty. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, no! The plank's falling. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> what are you looking at? <laughs> VR arcades like these are touted as a way for us to experience the best that VR has to offer without shelling out for expensive and ever-changing kit or having to find space in our living rooms, something that's especially relevant here in tightly packed Tokyo. To really sell the feeling of immersion, each game has its own custom interactive rig. There's the VR fishing rod, Bicycle, Segway, other self-balancing transportation scooters are available, fighter jet, skis, complete with chilled air fan, and, of course, the giant VR robot thumb. I'm sitting on Gundam's hand. Oh, my gosh! <laughs> I'm going up! Wow! Oh, I can feel the heat of the laser sword. But the one drawing the biggest crowds, unsurprisingly, features this guy. You hair around the track, talking to your friends on your headset while smacking them with hammers or hurling exploding turtles at them. No way! Oh, my God! I'm inside Mario World. This is, this is wild! Oh, mind the bombs. Gotcha! Whoa! Hello, Luigi. Whoa! Oh! All these years I've been saying, if you try and simulate motion in VR when you're not actually moving, it's an unpleasant experience. It's still an unpleasant experience. This isn't the first VR arcade that we've seen, but it is the first place we've seen so many people getting genuinely... Uh, <laughs> excited about strapping a headset onto their face. Even so, this place does make you appreciate just how far VR has to go, from the pages of instructions to the legions of staff managing each experience. The whole thing is still complicated, confusing and cumbersome. Depending on who you ask, augmented reality could be the ultimate end game for VR. That means overlaying information onto the world around us, like this projection-mapped climbing wall. The climbing routes can be changed in software, plus programmers can add in extra features and mini-games, like the punishing puffs of air when I get something wrong, which is quite often. Anyway, that's it from Click in Japan for this week. Don't forget we love on Twitter at BBC Click and all that business. I'll see you soon. Ah.